What's happening, everybody? It's Sean with Reactions to the Classics. Today, we got a reaction of Bright Eyes, their brand new album, Five Dice, All Threes, brought to you by friend, longtime supporter, and patron of the channel, Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin. Appreciate you. Appreciate all the patrons who make this thing go. If you'd like to support us in any way, check out that Patreon link below or the patron link on the end screen. I've got most of the Bright Eyes discography off. I think this is the first. We have 3,000 videos. I think this is the first time I've ever reacted to an album the day it drops. It might have been another one, but I don't think so. So... Keep in mind, now I've mind, I've read a few interviews and stuff like that, so I'm going to bring you some facts and stuff, but there's not a lot out there. So if you're watching this review way later on, you know, you're like, oh, well, this song's about this. You had to know that. Like, there's nothing out there, man. So trying to interpret Connor's songs on first listen because he's such a fantastic songwriter is challenging. So I look forward to it. 11th studio album released in September of 2024, released today, September 20th of 2024. Fall up to 2020's Down in the Weeds, where the world once was, their, which was their first album since 2011's The People's Key. So, you know, three albums in 13 years. Inspired partly by Connor Oberst, of course, the group leader, working with the artist Alex Orange Drink of New York indie punks, the So So Glows, who co wrote several tracks. Connor said, quote, Alex was in LA in the winter of 2023, writing songs with Tim Armstrong from Rancid and Operation Ivy, who has a studio here for different projects. He was staying with me at my house, and I think he got sick of just watching me smoke cigarettes on my porch doing nothing. He was like, what are you doing today? Nothing? Okay, well, let's write a song. We started hanging out with guitars on the porch, very old school, and wrote a lot of songs. Some of them might end up on one of his records, but a bunch of them felt bright eyes centric. He was instrumental to getting this record made, just out of friendship and encouragement. He's just such a positive person, end quote. Once the band had finished, uh, Connor had finished writing with Alex Orange Drink, the band went back to Omaha their hometown, and my hometown, by the way, where they keep a studio between Mike Mogus's and Connor Ober's homes, right? Connor says it's a really ideal situation. When friends come to record, they can stay at my house. He also said, this time, talking about this album, I still hope the songs resonate and have equal amounts of meaning, but as far as the sounds and approach to the music, it's a bit lighter than the 2020 album. We'll just call it Down in the Weeds. I'm going to give you the whole title. The word fun is really used to describe my band, but maybe it is a bit more fun. Yeah, I would say that's true. When we were last on tour, we were cruising around with 14 piece band and string and horns. This record's just going to be guitars, rock and roll stuff. And referring to 2005 starkly produced landmark, I'm Wide Awake It's Morning, Mike Mogus laughs. It took us 20 years to make another record that sounds like a band playing live. That's really good because I think that's their best album, but it's a tough call. We've never been on this before. The music won't be in the video, but, but don't worry. It's going to be in that Vimeo link below. You got to listen to it because you don't know it if you're watching this or if you're watching it, you know. Pretty soon after it drops, at least. All right, let's go. To the album opener, Five Dice. I mean, every album opener is odd. Not in a bad way, but it's never a song. So I'm going to expect this is the same way, but I have no idea. I'm going to have the lyrics up as always, which are going to be highly important. They always are. I've said it before. Connor's one of the best songwriters of this century. Thanks again, Caitlin. Let's do it. All right, well, I was right. I mean, it might have been Connor in the beginning. I don't know, but it's a bunch of movie clips. I don't know what they are. If you're watching this later on, they'll be readily available, I'm sure. Only a minute, 39 long. I mean, the album's called Five Dice, All Threes. Another song later on is going to be called All Threes, so that's where you get it. It's a good name because it's a unique name. Let's go to a song. I actually do know one of the two songs that were released ahead of time. I have a song reaction to this up, Bells and Whistles. All right, Bells and Whistles. I knew this song, but I've only heard it once. I don't like to listen to them over and over when I haven't listened to the album yet because it influences your favorites. But the first part of the song is kind of about Princess Diana and in verse two. Zach staggering down Bleecker Street. The label asked for a meet and greet. So Zach from the So So Glows. Uh, and then like he gets to the chorus. No, he shouldn't go home with the Soho girl, meaning the rich girl. If you live in Soho and you're not rich, I'm sorry, not trying to stereotype. Because she only wants materials and you shouldn't place bets on the New York Mets because at best it's hypothetical. Sorry, Mets fans. Expensive seats in a field of dreams. U-turns and limousines. You turn can't do a U-turn in a limousine unless you got an eight-lane highway. Got to get around the detour when it's blocked. Bells and whistles, fancy cheap thrills cost a lot. So all these things seem like they're a good idea, but they're going to cost you down the line. And Connor said about the song, this is a song about the many little details in life that can seem insignificant or frivolous or temporary at the time, but eventually end up forming your destiny. It's also kind of a whistle while you work scenario, which it is. Next up, you already see it below, El Capitan. It's an interesting title, man. Let's go. All right, El Capitan. You know, the last song, Bells and Whistles, had everything. It had Celeste. It had a banjo, it had a harmonium, it had a trombone, it had all this stuff. This one more traditional, you know, except at the very end, because we're getting that El Capitan, that Mexican theme in there. But it's a breakup song, man. It's a breakup song that could turn bad. You know, it gets really, uh, it gets really tough. 
You know, I like the line at the start of the second one, second verse. Yeah, everything was roses every night. It was bass and wine. Some of it was all great until it wasn't. So it's time to pay the piper. Don't want to watch. Don't want to be the last in line. They'll auction you at Christie's. You're going to fetch a handsome price. And in time, they'll decide what was yours and what was mine. And you end up in a ditch dream feeling like the color of the sky. So you're playing your Nintendo, spun out like a gramophone, living in a basement, sleeping down there all alone. The conditions were perfect, more perfect for a storm. Then they found you in the morning, hanging from an extension cord. So we're, we're revisiting these themes that Connor used to like when he was younger. And then the world's on fire. California's a crucible. We're running out of water. They already stole the gold. California's running out of water. Of course, in the 1840s and 50s, they already stole the gold. You kept kissing me like Judas. Your betrayal was apropos. So I imagine she cheated on him. You said I'm washed up. And that's what I get for growing old. So a really good song. You're probably going to not see me bopping along to many songs, right? Because I got to be locked on these lyrics because I want to follow him, man. He's so freaking good and with no research and no way of knowing what they're about. I've got to discern for myself. So we'll see how wrong I get this. But I think I'm doing pretty good so far, although Five Dice wasn't hard to figure out, right? Next up, we have Boss Jan Adore. Did I butcher that? I mean, probably. Takes its title from the 20th century Dutch performance artist whose final act found him sailing into the Atlantic Ocean, never to return. If you already knew that, you're going to get extra credit points. What a song. Had a lot of banjo in there. Dial that thing back. Had a little pedal steel in there. And, you know, it's pretty interesting because things are just kind of talking about things going on in the world. It's like, what well, it takes a lot of nerve to live on planet Earth. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times, right? Well, Charles Dickens. And then they go, it was the worst. So it's not the best or worst, it was the worst. And then saw so you walking up with a basket of fruit in a funeral suit through the door, paying respects to the dead insects who have eaten through the apple core. So he's talking about all that. And he's got a lot to learn living on planet. It was the best of times, the worst of times. And he says, it was. they say it was the worst in harmony. And then he, Connor says it was the worst. And then shamrock on a jacket, dropped into a casket. Baby, that's no way to die. I never thought I'd see 45. So it turns a little autobiographical introspective, right? How is it that I'm still alive? Search of that miraculous mystery, crying on a movie screen, leaving the harbor with Bosch on a door, sailing out to sea. And then we get the, it takes a lot of nervous sail around the world. It's the best of times, it's the worst of times. But now it was the best. It was the best. So Connor actually turns this around into upbeat, which is not, you know, Connor style, which nothing wrong with that. And then in Los Angeles, it was the best. In Los Angeles, I want to see out to sea, two different seas, out to sea. It was the best in LA. I love her soul. So, Finish this out positive. And I see what the quote was talking about in the beginning. Like they sound like a, a, a really banned album here, right? Not that I don't think the other ones didn't sound that way, but a lot of di differentiated instrumentation. I like it. Next up, a song that, I mean, I just have a feeling. Are we going to go back to the dark side, boys and girls, a little bit? We got Tiny Suicides. All right. I would love to know what all those movie quotes are for. I can't find it. I just looked too. I just looked on Reddit. I can't, I can't find it. This song, I'd love to know everything that went into this song, what it's about. I mean, I think the tiny suicides are all the little hurt we go through in life. Like the slowly killing us, the tiny suicides. I could be wrong there, but I mean, you know, he's he's talking about the futurist abyss is on the rise. And I saw in an interview, we talked about AI and how AI is fine, but you know, it's killing the arts. Can they just stay out of the arts? I agree hundred percent. You get AI, AI art, like paintings, you can get obviously AI music, like AI everything. He said, try to tip my way into heaven's gate. Must have lost a fortune along the way. So I think talking about how you can purchase your way to heaven in certain religions and also maybe the cult, heaven's gate. You can look it up if you want to know. I, you probably don't want to know. I never saved up for a rainy day. I put all, it all upon the brass collection plate. Another uh, shout out against religion. Am I going to die or beat back all these tiny suicides? Maybe if the sky aligns, maybe I could have you one last time. Was it the silence that amplified the reverb in my mind? Someday we all die. Why give in to these tiny suicides? I think that Bright Eyes uses the pedal steel better than any other, quote, non-country group to add this atmosphere, right? This atmosphere of sadness. And I think it just works so, so well. I'm going to have a really hard time picking favorites on this album. I'm just letting you know ahead of time. All right, next up, we have All Threes. Now, this has 1,500 streams which i know is nothing bells and whistles has 733 in our next track rainbow express has 369 that tells me either early on in the first whatever it is 18 hours that this album's been out what a less that this is either caught fire or it's the next quote single but this one features cat power so cat power will be on this one and uh that's with everything else that's all i know
All right, all threes. I mean, Cat Power is credited as the writer on Genius, which is a website I use for lyrics. I don't know that that's true, but maybe it is. I have no way of knowing. She might be a co writer. I don't know. But Cat Power's all over this, sings the outro, basically, sings the second half of which is just all threes. I don't know what all threes means. There's more of a stream of consciousness, I think, lyrics on this one, which makes me think maybe Connor didn't write or didn't write it alone. But then I think he did write part of it or he had to written part of it because I saw him in an interview talk about Elon Musk. I won't give you those quotes, but let's put it this way. Uh, Connor's not a fan of Elon. And he says, Elon Musk and Virgin Whites, I kill him in an alley over five dice. So a throwback to the album title. But a really well done song. Connor's voice paired up with Cat Powers gives this a nice texture to it. You know, Connor's voice works really well with a, with a nice female voice coming in there. So it's a good song. Instrumentally is more chilled too, but still different than the last track, Tiny Suicide. So I like that. Now we get to the other track. I know I did a reaction to it. We got Rainbow Overpass. Uh, this one, Alex Orange Drink is on here with him. And this song is, is fantastic. Rainbow Overpass, Alex Orange Drink actually gets to sing on this one. A really well done arrangement as far as album running order, right? Because we come off Tiny Suicides and All Threes, and then we punch it back up with this. A very, very upbeat song, especially for Bright Eyes. Connor said, Alex and I wrote a lot of the songs together, but Rainbow Overpass is the only one he gets to sing a verse. He's kind of like my hype man, getting a little Beastie Boys on this. They grew up on punk rock and the Beasties, so... There are a lot of little outbursts of other voices. I feel that it creates energy. Sometimes music can feel flat until you get into a live situation where there's adrenaline and raw energy. Instead of working in reverse where that happens as we tour, I was trying to get some of that energy into the record. I think they very much did so here. He's just kind of saying, you know, in the chorus, but I'm not shutting down. No, I'm not shutting down, but I'm not shutting down. I'm shutting up. So you won't hear me when I say everything's okay. I'll see you around. And it talks about all these other things. And I, the pre-course, and I can't be where you need me to be because I'm asleep at the wheel, probably. And then, so I'm not slowing down. No, I'm not slowing down. I'm not slowing down. I'm speeding up so you won't see my brake lights flash on that rainbow overpass. That's how we get the the uh, title of it. I'll see you around. I'll see you around. So um, I already knew that song. I, mean, I said I don't want to listen to it once, but man, it's really good. Now we come up to Hate. I researched it out. I read some interviews. It's, it's an intensely pessimistic song about how, in your words, the interviewer saying to Connor, the bad guys always win. Connor said, having lived in California for a good bit of time, there's a cultural thing that's like the affirmations hanging on the wall of an Airbnb. Live, laugh, love kind of stuff. Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. But personally, when I look at the world, I don't feel a lot of gratitude. I feel gratitude for my friends and my wife, but I don't feel gratitude for humanity. I feel the opposite. I feel a complete and utter terror for humanity. I'll just tell you about the song. I can tell you this about after it, but it's, it's, sometimes I think it's good knowing it going in so you can kind of listen for it. The first verse of that song is also about how I think that organized religion is one of the worst things that's ever happened to humankind and that it causes such incredible pain. You don't have to be an exceptionally intelligent person to make this judgment. These people have been killing each other over effing nonsense for millennia. I tried to get all the religions and cults in there, but I only had so many lines to work with. One line on that song, right hand on the Bible and the truth is still irrelevant, also recalls politicians swearing their oath of, oaths of office. Connor says, I mean, the hypocrisy of all that stuff is so palpable. I think 95% of politicians are full of it. I didn't have to get a PhD to come up with that conclusion. I just happened to have read the newspaper for most of my life. So I'll have some thoughts on this, I'm sure, but I will wait till I hear the actual song. All right, the arrangement on this was nice. You know, some piano. Sound like a drum machine. If it's the drums with Jason Basil, then I, I apologize. But it sounds like a drum machine in there. And a little effect on Connor's voice. It's a tiny one. It's not auto-tuned or anything. It's just a little effect to kind of give it that, that ambiance, man, that they're going for here. He has got it all covered, right? And, you know, I hate the Puritans, Mary Magdalene, Jesus Christ. I hate you now and I hated you before. I mean, I've shared this before on the channel all the time. I'm a Christian. I'm a, I'm a hardcore Christian, although I don't go to church. I haven't been to church for, I guess, this month. It'll be five years. I used to be a pastor for a little while, like churches. I see, I know what, exactly what he's saying with organized religion. I see these morons on TV speaking all this hate and identifying themselves as Christians. They do not understand the Bible. Like that is not what the Bible's about, but he gets to all of it. I hate prophets. I hate LA shamans. And he's going to, I hate Vishnu. So he's covering the, uh, he's covering the Hindus. He David Koresh, Jim Jones. So 
cult, Buddhist, who's got the Buddhist covered. So he's just going on about all this stuff. And then he says, uh, you know, don't you know the bad guys always win? They really don't at the end when this world's over with, but that's a that's a whole nother story. But he brings it full circle, as Connor often does. The next, uh, there's three lines left when he says, I hate the protest singer staring at me in the mirror. So himself, but you know, we went from all this happiness of rainbow overpass, or at least the upbeat, to just turn it into just an absolutely insanely cynical song, Hate, but it's a good song. Now we go to real Phil, 105 degrees, and living in Dallas, Texas, I can tell you, I really know what that feels like. All right, real Phil, 105 degrees, where he mentions he's in LA and it really feels like 105 at the time. So he's probably talking about what we like to call the heat index, not the temperature, but what it really feels like, like a wind chill on the opposite side. That's what I've learned to live by here in Dallas. Right now, on September 20th, it's 109 degrees heat index. We have unseasonably high heat. Uh, so it's about a girl and about his angst that he wants to be with her, a broken relationship. Pretty long ways through the song, I was selfish and cruel to put that on you. Or where you saw a rope swing, I saw a noose. There's too much to untangle to get to the truth. What was I thinking? I just couldn't say. My longing used to know no bounds, always incomplete, but you're, you're all that I'm wanting now, the instrumentation on this song is fantastic as well. Um, all these songs are good and pretty diverse, as I said, you know, instrumentation wise. Next up, we have Spun Out. All right, get the cinematic element again. Like I said, if I would have waited a week to do this, I'd probably know what all that was, but I didn't want to wait to wait a week to do this. And we got the dice again in there. So we get this recurring theme. And I was talking about instrumental diversity before this song. I had no idea that Spun Out would have... The turntable spin, like we're giving, we're giving Connor a little hip hop uh, mix in the middle of this song, and the instrumentation everywhere it gives you this little kind of angst, is the best way to put it. And he talks about out on the wedge, so he's out on the wedge, literally, I think, and he's kind of talking about all of that, and maybe he's just figuratively out there. But twenty one in a bar, just sixteen with a card, you know, fake ID, putting cracks in my heart, makes it all fall apart. It's doomed from the start. All the house and the strobe lights went dark. I couldn't save you. I can relate to Nabokov's virtue, the Russian author and poet, or love's interchangeable parts. So they're always going to be well written, even if I don't know exactly what they mean in the moment. I mean, you can discern most of what most of these songs mean, but there's always a there's always another layer to it, and that's what makes Connor a great songwriter. Three songs left. We got Trains Still Run on Time. All right, the recurring cinematic theme here. A very upbeat tune like Rainbow Overpass. Trains Still Runs on Time. Taking a little American exceptionalism as he's, he's known to do at times, and I totally agree with, but it's so catchy, right? The train still runs on time. So everything's still going just like it should, no matter what's going on around you. I mean, one of the verses that made in America on a factory four, there's a Disney character breaking down the door and the orchestra plays a cartoon score for war. Almost 30 seconds there, I think, somewhere in that neighborhood of a cartoon score right there. So I thought that was cool. And then we jump right into no separation, no Berlin Wall, no celebration, no confusion. So a uh, another like diverse song on here. Like they definitely don't settle into a pattern. Got two songs left. I was looking forward to hearing this one when I researched. The time I have left featuring Matt Berenger. So Matt, of course, the lead singer of the national, one of my favorite groups, period. So in an interview, uh, the interviewer asked Connor, he said, one of the mo most exciting and surprising features on this record is the nationals, Matt Berenger. How did that come about? Have you known him for a while? Connor said, I have. I've been a fan of the National since Alligator, which came out in 2005. I think their second best album. I was living in New York. They were living there too. I love the band. I know all of them and they're all very sweet people, but I know Matt best. We've done some podcasts together. I remember one time in 2014, we did some of the two of us and we met at the same studio here. It's one of those things where we're supposed to chat for like 30 minutes and two hours of drinking wine and laughing and talking. At some point, the engineer was like, well, I think we got enough. He's so wonderful and generous. And we wrote that song. I could hear his voice. I could hear it. I texted him and I was like, hey, we're making this song. I think you'd sound great on it. I sent him our early version. And he wrote right back and said he loved it and let's do it. I don't know where he was, but he recorded his part and sent it to us. And we put it together and sent it back. We made sure that he liked it. And that's what you hear. He did the same thing with Cat Power. Cat Power was at home in Miami. So Cat Power recorded their part and sent it back to him as well. So Technology, man. You don't got to be in the same place. Okay, the time I have left. I love Matt Berenger's voice. I think he's got one of the most unique voices in all of music, and I think it sounds great on here. Comes in a little bit harmonizing and get a little bit of verse from himself 
in, in the bathtub. So I would like to ask you the time. Yeah, I would like to ask you the time I have left. Water keeps running asleep in the bathtub. All of these bad dreams are coming to me to get me. It's just semantics. No, I couldn't answer it. But the question is, the question is the same. I'd like to ask you the time. I'd like to ask you the time that I have left. The first half of the song I loved. I got to be honest, it's first listen. This could change. But the second half of the song, I hated. I hated when the turntable came back and they were altering up the voices and doing all that. It made the song interesting and diverse arrangement wise, but I, I hated it. I wish they would have kept it like it was. It was a powerful song. And maybe I'll go back and listen to it because I will go back and listen to this album. And I will go back and listen to this song probably uh, several times. Maybe it'll grow on me and I'll have a different story. But hey, guys, this is what you get with First Reaction. I'll go to the 13th and final track. We got 10 Soldier Boy. All right, 10 Soldier Boy on an album that is so diverse. It seems appropriate that the last thing we hear, besides the cinematic stuff that's been finishing out songs, is Nate Walcott's trumpet, right? Because you had a harmonic in there that kind of started it off. Just the strumming guitar. Good harmonies on here. A little more upbeat as far as just the tempo of the song. It's really just about soldiering on through all of life's difficult times, I think, and difficult things. Um, I really won't break it down too much, but... That's kind of what I got out of it on first listen. Now we're going to go to my favorite tracks. Honorable mention, Trains Still Run On Time, Boss Yawn, Adore, El Capitan, and Bells and Whistles. My faves are going to be Rainbow Overpass. Probably not a surprise to you. All threes with Cat Power. And my favorite song on here is Tiny Suicides. Now we'll get to my overall score. Like a lot of bright eyes like you're not going to just casually listen to bright eyes i mean you might have to know it for a while, but if you're really going to dig in and want to understand it you got to kind of do what i did here and look at the lyrics because that connor deserves that because his lyrics are so good and you know you got to be reading them to process them but still it's like a race trying to process so i'm exhausted i really am like not in a bad way but like you, it's a it's a uh, labor of love when you sit down and listen to a bright eyes album for the first time <sighs> overall score this one's tricky, right? It, it's It's got some cohesiveness to it, mainly through the cinematic elements of those drops that are put in there. It's not super cohesive lyrically, which is fine. I don't think every album has to be some sort of concept album, but I do like it. It shows the, all the different things they can do. I'm kind of torn here from a couple of different scores. I'll go on the higher end. I'm going to go with an 8.0. It's really well done, as it should be at this point in their career, but it's really, really well done instrumentally, like production-wise. Connor sounds good. I mean, some people hate Connor. I did read a track-by-track uh, track review of this album. Where this, uh, this person obviously didn't like Connor. Like, I don't understand what this means. That means, like, you just got to dig in, man. You, you got to buckle up and dig in. So let me know what you think of this album. Now, if you're watching this months later, just keep in mind, I'll remind you one more time. This is day of release. It was fun to do it this way. I really enjoyed doing this way. Caitlin made that possible, so give her some love down in the comments. Let me know your favorites. What's your initial score on it? Where do you think it fits in the discography? Because I know a lot of Bright Eyes fans watch us, hardcore fans, and appreciate you guys. And until next time, guys, I will see you.